So then George came to me one day, I'll never forget this conversation, said, you know, you might be right about this alien thing. Maybe we shouldn't do aliens. There's too much of that stuff around. They're kind of extra dimensional. I said, what? He said, ever hear a string theory about different dimensions? I said, yeah. He said, okay, these are interdimensional beings. They're not extraterrestrials, they're interdimensional. Stephen actually didn't like that idea. Oh, that can't be good. Over the next couple of weeks, you're bound to see dozens of videos suggested to you much like this one, revisiting 2008's Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, mostly because the fifth film in the series is out on June 30th. It's not the years, it's the mileage. I'm sure most videos will come to defend the movie, while others are sure to echo a lot of the criticism that the movie faced upon its release. In the 15 years that have followed this movie's release, I've only rewatched it a couple of times, mostly at the end of marathoning the first three movies, sitting through it more out of obligation than desire. It's like when you found out that dessert is included with your meal, so you soldier on and order it even though you're stuffed, then you take a few bites and you're even more disgusted with yourself. That's kind of like what Crystal Skull can feel like, especially coming after Last Crusade. While a lot of fans have cited Last Crusade as the perfect ending to the series, plans for a fourth film kicked off just three years later. The catalyst for this was when Ford returned to play an older indie in an episode of Young Indiana Jones. The most sacred relic of my people's past. Well, here's a sacred relic of my past. Seeing Ford back in the role, this time a bit older and grizzled, George Lucas realized the potential in taking the series to a time period it had never been to, the 1950s. The idea of taking the genre from the 1930s serials, action-adventure serials, to the B science fiction movies of the 50s. Two potential scripts were commissioned. One was a rewrite of an unproduced Indiana Jones 3 script from 1985 by Chris Columbus. Lucas, however, championed his own idea of having the fourth film be more reminiscent of the 1950s sci-fi B-movies. Steven actually didn't like that idea. Lucas hired Last Crusade writer Jeb Stewart to bring his pitch to life in the form of Indiana Jones and the Saucer Men from Mars, written in 1995. Well, the original title on the original script was Indiana Jones and the Saucer Men, and that's what I wanted it to be, and then it went from there to things even like Indiana Jones and the Attack of the Giant Ants. Are you trying to develop a sense of humor or am I going deaf? Though it would take Crystal Skull another 13 years to materialize, the script introduced a lot of the elements that would make it into that movie, including a chase sequence set on Indy's college campus, man-eating killer ants, Indy escaping a nuclear blast by hiding in a fridge, and even an ending that featured Indy's wedding. Spielberg was unsure of the concept, though, and even considered stepping down as a director to let someone else take over. I guess I kind of humored George by going along with it, thinking, well, I'll never wind up directing this movie, though. I'll wind up producing it with George and somebody else. We'll get some young kid. Oh, that can't be good at all. He brought in Frank Darabont to write yet another draft, which took elements that Spielberg liked from Saucer Men from Mars, while shifting focus from Roswell, New Mexico, to an ancient civilization in the Amazon. Titled Indiana Jones and the City of the Gods, Darabont's script added a lot of elements that would also end up in the movie, such as an action set piece set in a secret military base, Indy's sidekick betraying him, an escape scene on a high-speed rocket sled, the inclusion of Marion Ravenwood and Professor Oxley, as well as a jungle chase driving over cliffs and waterfalls. Of course, this script also included the things borrowed from Saucer Men from Mars, such as the nuclear bomb scene, attacking ants, and the wedding ending. Darabont has gone on the record saying that everyone but Lucas loved his screenplay. It does contain some truly bizarre elements, though such as the alien at the ending transforming briefly into Hitler, and a wedding scene that saw Henry Jones Sr. singing Fly Me to the Moon. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Once again, Spielberg and Lucas cherry-picked elements from Darabont's screenplay that they liked, combining them with those saved from the previous drafts and ordered yet another rewrite. This process more or less continued into the mid-2000s, with Catch Me If You Can screenwriter Jeff Nathanson hired to write a draft the first to introduce the idea of Indy having a son, only for David Kep to later be brought in to rewrite that draft. This process of keeping sequences from each draft while adding in new ones really started to delude the story. That's where, in my opinion, Crystal Skull starts to suffer. Its identity is torn between wanting to be a 1950s B-movie homage and a more traditional jungle adventure. I then sort of thought, well, maybe I could do a kind of, you know, uh, there's a whole genre of ancient civilizations developed by aliens 
And I said, well, maybe I can move it into that, to, you know, without flying saucers and see if that would work. And I wanted to rest it on a cinematic antecedent. So I said, fine, fine. And honestly, my favorite parts of Crystal Skull are when it fully commits to its 1950s setting. Get that greaser! Everything from the soundtrack choices to the racing hot rods to the period costumes really give the movie a unique feel that we hadn't seen in the series before. I love the action scenes that make use of this new era as well. The diner escape slash motorcycle chase is one of the best action scenes in the whole series. I even really enjoy the nuclear bomb scene because, again, it really feels unique to this time period. Is it unbelievable? Sure. But this isn't a series known for its grounded realism. As the story progresses, that 1950s theme seems to be gradually discarded, though. The first half and second half of this movie feel like two different movies. In the first half, we get these great character moments that show Indy struggling to survive amongst the rapidly changing world. Brutal couple of years, huh, Charlie? Only for it to devolve into a CGI theme park ride in the second half. Get out of there! Ah, 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 ah! Monkeys! Monkeys! The early scenes with Mutt and Indy are really compelling. You know, for an old man, you ain't bad in a fight. Thanks a lot. What are you, like 80? While a lot of people seem to have a problem with Shia LaBeouf being cast in this movie, I feel his casting was one of the more inspired choices. Even before we find out that Mutt is Indy's son, the two of them have great chemistry. Thanks. <clears throat> I want to keep borrowing yours all the time. That's fine. Seeing the stern, know-it-all senior and the younger, brash hothead working together despite their differences is a lot of fun. Shut up. That's my mother you're talking about. All right? It's my mother. You don't have to get sore all the time just to prove how tough you are. Sit down. It's also reminiscent of a relationship we've seen in the series before. Why don't you stick around, Junior? Huh. I don't know. Why didn't you, Dad? These little moments show the character and performance were not the problem with Mutt, but rather how the script chose to reveal their relationship. I always like the fact that his name's Mutt, and, you know, his father figures were kind of being switched in and out of his life. And um, so now you got a, a kid who, who never really had a stable father, who had a mother who lived a really intense life, never really had a normal upbringing. He's kind of lost. I wish the movie had started with the two of them aware that they are father and son, albeit estranged. The story could have stayed mostly the same, with Mutt begrudgingly seeking his father's help after Marion goes missing, knowing he's the only hope in finding her. This could have allowed us to see their relationship grow from the start, without them having to force in the scene just so Marion can reveal the truth to Indy. Why the hell didn't you make him finish school? In the beginning, it was a daughter he didn't know about, and uh, I thought that'd be a great thing. Stephen actually didn't like that idea. Oh. Okay, I love you for him. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Take my hand. Oh, yeah. Marianne Raven. <laughs> it's also easy to forget this, but Karen Allen's involvement was intended to be kept completely secret until the movie's release. That's why the story is so vague about who Mutt's mother is, and why when she finally does appear on screen, it's framed like a big reveal. Indiana Jones. When you think about it, it's kind of ridiculous that Indy wouldn't have been able to piece this together on his own. Marion Ravenwood is your mother. Oh, for God's sake, Indy, it's not that hard. Especially considering Mutt says that he was raised by Oxley, who, along with Indy, was a close friend of Abner Ravenwood. Mutt even says his mom's first name, though he uses a nickname. She said you'd help me. Well, me? What's your mom's name again? Mary? Mary Williams, you remember her? a lot of Mary's kid. Shut up! That's my mother you're talking about. Couldn't Indy have put all of this together? This is the man that has solved some of the world's toughest puzzles, yet he can't figure out that Mary is Marion, even with the Oxley connection? <laughs> the only reason he doesn't figure this out was again because Marion being in the film was supposed to be kept secret, but as they decide against this halfway through filming, it just doesn't make much sense from a character perspective. Same old, same old. But that's the least of things that don't make sense in the second half of this movie. As soon as the Crystal Skull shows up, ironically enough, logic seems to vanish from the film, raising countless questions. 
It goes from this interesting adventure with Mutt and Indy to introducing more supporting characters all from different drafts of the screenplay that just don't meld well together. Like Mac, a character that's actually pretty fun thanks to Ray Winstone's performance, but who never seems to make a single sensical decision in the story. Sorry, Jonesy. So what are you, uh, a triple agent? Mac betrays Indy at the start, but then after the Russians capture Indy, he reveals that he's a double agent. Be smart, do the right thing just like you. Like in Berlin, got me? Only for him to betray Indy again at the end. Why is he so vague about being a double agent anyway? If the goal was to deceive Indy into thinking he was a double agent, couldn't he just flat out tell him that instead of trying to hint at it? I'm seeing eye at eye! I almost screamed it at you in the tent. I said, just like Berlin. What were we in Berlin, mate? Double, double agents. Agent. One, they're alone in this tent, and two, even if the Russians would have overheard him saying this, so what? They'd know he was lying to Indy, so why the secrecy? A gigantic pile of money. Why does Mac barely put up an attempt to be saved? It's not like he was holding them back or sacrificed himself to save them, he just kind of gives up. I'm gonna be alright. What does that even mean? Some more questions raised during the second half are as follows. When Indy and Marion are trapped in the quicksand, why does Mutt use a snake to pull them free when he could so easily use his jacket to pull them out as they're literally like three feet away? I guess there were no vines available. The only thing he can come up with is a, is a 13 foot snake. Why when Mutt gets caught on a vine in the jungle, do they just keep driving and leave him there? Couldn't they just back up and let him drop down instead of leaving him in the middle of a dangerous jungle by himself? What is their motivation to get to Akator first anyway? They have Oxley, they have the skull, everyone is safe, screw the Russians, why don't they just let them go instead of pursuing them? Mutt even seems to question this. But even Indy can't give a logical answer. The skull has to be returned. I'll do it. Nobody else has to come. Who cares? brought us nothing but trouble. I have to return it. Why you? Because it told me to. And if they told you wolverines would make good house pets, would you believe them? And these are just some of the gaps in character logic that come up. I haven't even gotten to the monkeys. <laughs> monkeys! And the nonsense with the waterfalls. Look, I've already made the case that certain scenes from the previous Indiana Jones movies aren't very realistic. But even when there are fantastical elements or death-defying escapes introduced, there is still logic behind them. Like when Indy, Shirtround, and Willie jump out of the plane using the inflatable raft. It's unrealistic that they'd survive, but they literally had no other options, so why wouldn't they give it a try? These movies were great in backing Indy into a corner in which he had to figure out how to escape quickly. The scene here with the car going over the waterfalls is the complete opposite of this. Again, they have Oxley, they have the skull, everyone is safe, so why are they trying to beat the Russians to Akator? Because it told me to. Is it really worth risking their lives? I'll even give them this first drop, but then it happens not one, not two, but three more times. Let's come back to that raft drop in Temple of Doom again. As implausible as this is, they at least shot an actual raft falling from the sky using dummies and landing in the snow below. It adds a layer of plausibility that is so lacking in this successive CGI found in Crystal Skull. And honestly, that's the component that really drags this movie down. While the previous three Indiana Jones movies are filled with special effects, the filmmakers also knew their limitations. The writers may have written daring action set pieces, but they were all written knowing they could be achieved through clever cinematography, miniatures, models, and other practical effects. For the first time ever, we had created dummies that as they fell, they kicked. You know, nowadays with CGI, they, they cheat. We actually did it for real. The very first shot of the movie even highlights this. Writing an Indiana Jones movie in the age of CGI basically let the sky be the limit. Now for King of the Crystal Skull, it's nearly all digital. I'm, I'm doing one small miniature set but uh, everything else has been digital. Digital photography, digital matte painting, uh, 3D modeling and rendering. You look at something like Last Crusade, which featured dozens of real rats in the sewer, or the hundreds of live bugs used in Temple of Doom. Yet here, they couldn't even figure out how to make a single groundhog come out of a mound, so they just animated one end. <laughs> Same thing with the tank chase in Last Crusade. It feels so thrilling and real because it was filmed in a way that genuinely looks real. 
And then you watch the behind the scenes videos and you see just how much labor and planning went into a single shot like this. And honestly, there's nothing in Crystal Skull that captures that same feeling. The writers and filmmakers therefore didn't have to get clever with the action and set pieces here, as CGI allowed them the freedom to envision any scenario, which is fine in your standard modern action movie, but not in an Indiana Jones movie. It's just such a shame because Spielberg is the king of embracing the technical limitations of filmmaking and using it to create mystery and awe in his films. When the shark didn't work in Jaws, it led to a far more interesting and suspenseful film. When CGI hadn't yet been perfected for Jurassic Park, he went for a combination of animatronics and computer animation for a truly unique blend that still holds up. Really spectacular, spared no expense. When Harrison Ford injured his back filming Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg abandoned an entire planned fight sequence for what is now considered one of the film's most iconic moments. That's the real reason so many people have a problem with the unrealistic elements here as opposed to the earlier movies. Here, instead of figuring out clever ways to execute these set pieces in a way that feels grounded and real, they just use CGI and digital effects. And it really undercuts the action and pulls us out of the story. It's a shame that they didn't realize this at the time because the scenes that work, like that motorcycle chase, really comes close to that classic Indiana Jones action that we all craved. But as the movie gets to the second half, the less and less real the action feels. Then you mix in the gaps in character logic and you're left with a pretty messy film. Not as easy as it used to be. When this movie was announced, everyone seemed to make jokes that Harrison Ford was too old to play Indy. But watching this movie now, I have to give him credit for just how energetic he is in this role again. His performance as Indiana Jones is one of the reasons this movie is still worth watching. It comes to scorpions, the bigger the better. The small one bites you. Don't keep it to yourself. I would watch Indiana Jones go grocery shopping just because of the way Ford plays this character and how much passion he's brought to the role. There must have been plenty of women for you over the years. There were a few, but they all had the same problem. Yeah, what's that? They weren't you, honey. And his work in Crystal Skull is no exception. I don't want to add to the endless negativity and speculation on Dial of Destiny, but I do worry that the filmmakers again rely too heavily on CGI, instead of action scenes that could be filmed in a practical way. Regardless of the reception that Dial of Destiny has, I think it will cause a lot of people to come back to this movie with a newfound appreciation though. How much of human life is lost in waiting? Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is worth revisiting from time to time. Even if it's not as rewatchable as the first three, it's a lot better than most modern action movies. There's a really good movie hidden in here that is bogged down by the things that don't work. And I'm not even talking about the aliens, but rather how everyone involved just seemed more content to do things the easy way with CGI, rather than the innovative way that has come to define why we love those first three movies so much.